I wanted to share with you my encounters that I have had in, of all places, Davenport, Iowa. My first was when I was about eight years old. I used to play under the old bridge along the railroad tracks. I loved going down there, collecting rose quartz and sometimes Indian arrowheads. The tracks were heavily wooded on both sides, and one day I saw what looked like a big ground nest, so I decided to go investigate, as it looked odd and out of place. When I finally got up to it, I remember smelling a musky, skunky odor, but it was faint. I then noticed some items lined up in a perfect row, right next to the nest. I remember a bottle cap, a small tin can, and a few other items that I can't quite recall, and I was thinking that it must be a hobo that slept there. The next thing I remember, I was waking up from a very nice nap under the tree umbrella, about four feet down from the nest. My shirt was raised up and my shorts were unsnapped and splayed open. Basically, my belly was completely exposed. I was not afraid and I did not feel violated or anything, but it was a complete mystery to me for all of these years. I wanted to talk to my mom or dad, but I knew if I did, they would never let me play down there anymore. A couple of years later, I was on the opposite side of the tracks on the other side of the bridge, walking through the woods, singing and daydreaming when I heard a branch snap. I didn't see anything and I didn't think much about it, but then I heard it again and I looked a little more intently. Still nothing, so I dismissed it. But then, suddenly, a few moments later, an overwhelming fear hit me that made me feel that I was in danger and I had to get out of there fast. Again, I was thinking maybe a hobo was down there and might have assaulted me or worse. Then a couple of years later, a bunch of us teenagers were building a fort down there with my dad's help and after a full day, just before dusk, we grabbed all of our tools and climbed up from under the bridge. We were just standing there talking for a few minutes with my dad when we heard a horrendous scream. It sounded like it was 300 yards or more down the track line. I did not know what it was at the time and neither did my dad or anyone else, but it seemed full of anguish. In hindsight, knowing what I do now, I realize I must have been hit with infrasound on the first two occasions because it's the only thing that makes sense out of what happened to me, and I definitely now know what a Sasquatch scream sounds like, and that's exactly what it was, no doubt about it. I spent many summers camping and hiking around the highlands of the Cascade Mountain Range. In the summer of 1976, my friend and I hiked 15 miles up several remote trails in the Mount Stewart Mountain Range. We stopped to rest near a little outlet on the side of a hill where the water flows down out of the mountain. This hillside leads to the other side of the mountain. We had just removed our backpacks when we looked out across the outlet and spotted what we first thought was a bear. As we watched it going up the mountainside, we quickly realized that it was not a bear. It was at least eight feet tall, covered in brown hair, and was standing up on two feet. Its posture was that of a human as it moved, using its hands as a human would when pulling oneself up. It finally reached up to a high point and pulled itself over the top. It then turned sideways, sidestepped, and turned to look at us. It had a look of what I would say was, I'll stay out of your way, I just need a drink of water. It then turned and walked upright off into the woods. I have no doubt it was a Bigfoot that we were fortunate enough to see at the base of Asgard Pass. At that time, I knew people were hunting Bigfoot, so I did not report it. I did not want to invite the hunters who would have flocked to the area to track it. It has kept to itself all these many years without harming any of us. It's an intelligent being, which means it can think. Why hunt something that is so peaceful? Let it live in peace. I used to haul bundles of newspapers late at night, early morning for the local paper. One area I drove through was a fairly new road in southwest Eugene, Oregon, just east of Willow Creek Road. The area is protected wetlands near the semiconductor plant. It was during the peak of the Perseids meteor shower that I decided to pull over because it was really dark and I could probably see the night sky better. I had to relieve myself anyways, 
So I got out and walked around my van to the side of the road and gazed at the sky while doing my business. I was looking up when out of the lower half of my vision, I saw something move. It couldn't have been more than 20 feet away. I saw a huge, hairy, broad-shouldered figure stand up, turn its back to me, and calmly walk off into the brush. If I hadn't already just peed, I would have marked my territory in my pants. I very quickly dashed around the van, hopped in, and took off. The creature was at least seven feet tall, though it was hard to tell because where it stood was lower than the road where I was. But he was taller than me, and I am six foot one. It had no neck, its head and shoulders were mountain-shaped into one angled peak. As it moved, it sort of moved its arms with a breaststroke motion to get through the brush. I could hear the branches and twigs breaking as it pushed its way through. Later I wondered who had been more frightened, me or the Bigfoot. I mean, imagine you're the poor creature, sitting there minding your own business, maybe watching the meteor shower, when suddenly, a human drives up right where you're sitting, parks its rig, walks right up in front of you, and marks its territory. If I was a Bigfoot, I might have been pretty intimidated too. The area remains undeveloped as part of the protected wetlands of Eugene. I never returned to the spot. I even took another route every day after that to purposely bypass the area. It happened in the fall of 2005, when the leaves are still falling and the campgrounds are closing for the season. My girlfriend and I were hiking down a closed dirt road that leads to a camping site southeast of Darrington. The weather was cool and cloudy, but it wasn't raining, a nice day for a walk. We had only hiked in far enough to be out of sight of our car when it suddenly became eerily quiet. There were no birds, squirrels, or anything moving. So quiet you could hear the leaves fall from the trees. I heard one leaf a good ten feet away tumble through a tree to the ground. Too quiet. Unnaturally quiet. We had our dog with us, who is normally quite fearless. She became very nervous and kept stopping and looking back towards the car. We had to really coax her to come. About a half mile in, she stopped and absolutely refused to go any further. The silence was intense, and we had the overwhelming feeling we were being watched. With the eerie feelings and the dog refusing to go on, we decided to turn around and head back to the car. About halfway back, we came across a huge pile of scat in the road that wasn't there when we came in. There was no evidence that an animal had scratched around or tried to bury it. It looked human, only gray in color. We left the area and have not had a chance to go back. My story is from my childhood. As a young girl, I was raised in the foothills of the lower region of the Cascade Mountains, in a small town called Morton. Stories of Bigfoot surrounded us, and we repeated most of them at sleepovers and campfires. Such a delight we took in sharing the tales of the tall, hairy creature. We didn't care if they were true or not. Little did I realize they were. And had I realized this, I wouldn't have been camping out with my friend in our backyard that night when we came upon not only his grunts and groans, but also a quick glimpse of him. My girlfriend Patty lived in the country on the outskirts of Morton. Her family of six had encountered numerous visitors from hobos to train track tramps throughout the years so my apprehension to sleep outdoors was a bit high. But after being consoled by Patty's mom that hobos only came around in the daytime for food, I felt more at ease and agreed to pitch a tent in her backyard, which faced numerous acres of wilderness. Her father started a small campfire for us, so we could enjoy a little warmth on that cool July night. We placed our sleeping bags outside the tent, crawled inside them, and sat by the fire. We began to share our boyfriend stories in between bites of burnt marshmallow, and snickered and snorted at quite a few of our silly little laughs. Joey had a tongue like a lizard, or, yeah, but that's better than being kissed by fish lips, and so on. It was somewhere in our laughter and the darkness of the night that I felt I was being watched. It was a very spooky feeling. I pulled myself deeper into the sleeping bag, and we continued the stories as the fire simmered down. A howling began in the distance. Coyotes. My eyes were as big as the full moon at this point. I searched the woods for any sign of danger. Nothing. Yet, there was something out there. 
I heard a few branches snap, one after another, like someone or something's heavy footsteps. Patty was still talking. I hushed her with my fingers and nodded towards the woods. She of course rolled her eyes at me. A grunt, almost a snort, came deep from the wilderness. Patty now quickly turned her face to view the woods, which were behind her. I was frozen. She said, a deer, we always get them around here. We kept watching and listening for more snaps of twigs and branches. Then, with the cinders of ash still glowing red and the brightness of the full moon, we saw him. A tall, dark figure, maybe over seven feet tall, huge. His eyes caught the reflection of the moon. They were intense, golden. His body was covered with hair. It was dark and difficult to see the color or thickness. His arm seemed to be unusually long. This great beast seemed to acknowledge our attention and slowly stepped back from in front of the tree line and into the shadows. Patty and I were petrified at this point. Neither one of us could move or scream or say anything. I opted to scream, but there was no voice in my throat. A few more grunts and then the sound of tree limbs being pulled down. The smashing branches and the groaning faded in the distance, as well as the heavy, thundering footsteps. Soon, all was silent again. I'm not sure which one of us gathered ourselves and ran back into the house first. But I do know what we saw and heard, and now understand it was a Bigfoot, watching us from the distance. My name is Jeff. I am from the very southern tip of Ohio. I am an honorably discharged Navy veteran, and I served during the Persian Gulf conflict. If you were to talk to anyone who knows me, they'd tell you I do not lie about anything. In 1986, I had gone deer hunting in an old coal strip mine area that is now part of the Wayne National Forest in Ohio. There have been many encounters with these things reported since the early 1800s in this area. This is what happened to me. It was bow season, 1986. I'm not for sure of the exact date, but I had scouted this area since early September. I built a few old-fashioned deer stands in a patch of woods that probably spanned about two miles. In each direction, there were a few old strip mine roads with two old strip mine ponds. I tried to alternate between the tree stands, going to a different one each day. This day, I decided to go to the stand that was maybe 40 to 50 yards away from one of the old ponds. I got to the tree stand around 5 a.m., and it was still dark, cold, and foggy, and the sun finally started to break. The fog started rolling back, and I started hearing a buzzing sound. I thought to myself, there can't be any bees' nests in this tree, especially as cold as it was. All of a sudden, I caught a glimpse of something out of the corner of my eye. I first thought it was a black bear, but as it broke through the fog, I made out what it really was. She was maybe six to seven feet tall and was carrying a baby one, and the whole time she was humming and looking at the baby. I don't know if it was a newborn or if it was sick, but she walked to the edge of the pond, got a scoop of water in her hand, and either gave it to the baby or wiped him off. But as quickly as she appeared, she turned and walked away through the thickest briar patch, and after that, I didn't hear the buzzing or humming anymore. I feel like she was so into taking care of the baby one that she didn't notice me setting up in the tree stand. This is probably one of the most uneventful encounters that has happened, but it's absolutely true. They do exist, and I know it to be a fact. I'm 25 and live in the central plains of America, and I have my entire life. So, I can fairly say I know what wildlife is here. I've heard of and seen the majority of it. I only state that to express later how blown away I was when my encounter happened. This is my experience. My brother lives on a farm with his wife and daughter. I've had to help him take care of a few pests and mountain lions before. So when he asked for my help with what he thought was another mountain lion, I said, of course. During the day, we looked around his land, trying to find tracks to see what we were dealing with, and we found nothing. I told him I couldn't see anything, and I asked him if he was messing with me. 
He told me he was absolutely sure because of the sounds he heard the days before calling me. I have to stop for a second to describe the area we were in. He has a built-in pond, probably 30 yards away from a tree line. Then, on the opposite side of us, is the house, about 100 yards away. We were about 15 to 20 yards away from the pond. As I was explaining how I didn't understand that we didn't find any tracks, there was a loud splash in the water of the pond. He has no fish in the pond. I turned and pointed my 30-30 at the tree line. My brother had his 870 express mag pointed in the same direction. We both exchanged the same look of what was that. Then he called out, This is private property. Come out and all is forgiven. No cops, no danger, and no harm done. After shouting, he lowered his aim and put his hand in the air for good faith and lowered his rifle. And I lowered as well. There was an odd silence for about 30 seconds. Then a scream I can only describe as something from Jurassic Park came from the tree line. I jumped and almost fell backwards, and I am not easily frightened. I aimed back at the line, expecting a chorus of mountain lions to come out. My aim dropped when this human-shaped object came out of the tree line that had to have been well over eight feet tall. My brother responded by calling out to the object that it has 15 seconds to clear off or it will be fired on. He started counting. By the time he hit six, it had begun walking towards us. We relaxed a little because we thought, oh, hey, whoever that guy is, is leaving. That thought left when it stopped and let out another yell. After feeling it in my chest, I knew this was going to end badly. It charged at us. The only thing we could do is hide behind our four-wheelers, run, or attempt a fight. I have never fired all four of my rounds as fast as that day, and it stopped charging and just looked at us. Then it just turned around and walked back into the tree line. We started the four-wheelers and drove back to his house, grabbed two of his AR-15s and a few mags, as well as his dog Buckley, and went back to the pond. After searching the area with Buckley, we found zero blood. There were prints, but no blood. My lever action holds four with an empty chamber. My brother's 870 Express Magnum holds four empty chambers. So four 3030 and four slugs have no blood. How is that possible? We both have no explanation, and yes, we are absolutely sure of what we saw. He took pictures of the prince, and he has yet to tell his wife of what we saw because he fears she'll mock him or leave him thinking he's crazy. My story is quite vivid and really scary. It happened while I was on a mini vacation in the year 2000 at Rathtrever Provincial Park on Vancouver Island during the summer. Exact date, I do not recall. I was car camping. Yeah, I know about the bears, so I didn't leave any food in the car. The car was a white Chevrolet Cavalier sedan, formerly owned by BC Tell. The back seat folded down and exposed the trunk, and there was just enough room from the front seats pushed forward to sleep back there with a foam cushion, a comforter, and a pillow. The first night I went for a stroll along the road to the beach. It was quiet there, except for sounds of pebbles rolling around the beach as though something big was moving. I didn't investigate, but I took in the Milky Way stars that were out at night and a small airplane circling the sky. I began to return to the park, and there was a lot of campers in the park that night. They had lots of campfires and cook stoves burning, and I saw the steam rising from the flames. I headed back from the beach to my car, which was parked near the caretaker's house, with a white light atop a pole over the backyard. My car was in a stall next to a fifth-wheel trailer. The house was to my southeast, the showers were further east, midway through the park, and the beach was halfway across the park to the far east. Here's the frightening part. It was the wee hours of the next morning. I heard the unmistakable sound of footsteps booming through the forest. I woke up as the sounds were deafening and saw a man-like ape creature in all black walking on the gravel road from east to west right past my car. It was 15 feet tall. It was just like the Patty film or the Patterson movie on Bigfoot except it was a male as its chest was bare. It walked right past me into the west and then stopped. At that time, I ducked down under my comforter. Then, when I heard no sounds, 
I picked up and saw it look in my stall area. Then it moved back in front and stopped and stood right behind my car. Then it backed up to survey the area looking for me. There was no tent. I noticed its eyes. They were glowing red. Then it looked down and spotted me. My jaw dropped. I was in awe and I tried to scream but I couldn't. It almost mimicked my face. Its look of fear then turned to anger as it glared at me. It had buck teeth like a horse and a mouth like a human with a tongue. Its face was hairless, but it had a cone head and it was all black. It looked to be 15 feet tall. Its feet were sideways to me, before when it was in my stall as it bumped the bumper with its legs below its knees. I estimate it had 24 inch feet, which were bare up past its ankles. It had human-like feet, but its walk was dragging like it estimated to be around 2,000 pounds. It continued to glare at me, and I had my Pantex camera ready, but I didn't take a picture because it was angry. It never made a sound from its voice, but it walked past my car into the bushes, between my car and the fifth wheel trailer. Next, I heard a man scream, please help me, it's going to kill me, as he ran into the trailer as it shook violently back and forth. I want to know, its chest was at least two upright pianos wide, with thick shoulders and arms and hands as wide as a car door, with palms bare and fingers four inches wide and 18 inches long. It was massive. I also want to add how this creature walked off away from me. I shook my shoulders and partially got up while still laying down on the bed, bracing myself with my elbows to take a look at the creature better. Just as I shook my shoulders, it flexed and shook its shoulders back at me. In a few short steps, it proceeded to come really close. It was lowering itself on all fours. Its head came right up to the back window, glaring at me with buck teeth. It moved to my left against the passenger side. Its upright head filled the entire window with its face. The look on its face was one of bewilderment as I saw its eyebrows slant upward like an angled roof line. I hid next to the comforter and it turned and walked away, upright past my car. I vowed never to camp again, and for the last 19 years, I have done just that. I never felt so alone and helpless as I felt that night. It's been a struggle, and I had nightmares for the longest time, wondering if that creature would come back to haunt me by sticking its head against my window at night again. I first started reading about Sasquatches in 1972, after my first encounter. I was born in Calgary, and about once a month, we would head to Banff to go camping. I got used to seeing wildlife at a young age. On the last weekend of August 1972, we went to Medicine Hat to visit friends. And on Saturday, the 26th, we went to have a picnic around 10.30 a.m. to Strathcona Park. We started a fire and then went down the South Saskatchewan River to swim and play in the water. It was sunny and warm, but no wind. At about 1 p.m., it was decided that we would make our way down the winding path to our campsite, which was about 150 yards away. Eager to get a hot dog on a stick, I ran ahead of everyone else. About 75 yards down the path, I was jogging. I was about 75 yards down the path that I was jogging when suddenly I smelled a strong odor. I stopped. It smelled like a freshly washed dog that had rolled around in garbage for a week. I heard a light rustle to the right, and as I turned, I looked and saw a large, black and red furred back of something facing away from me, to the west. I could hear the creak about 30 yards ahead of the creature I was looking at. Its butt was a couple inches off the ground. It was hunched over forward at some Saskatoon bushes and it had a cone-shaped head that seemed to be sitting on its shoulders. It was about four feet wide at the shoulders and about five feet high, and it made no sound or movement. Suddenly, it quietly muttered a chattering sound, and when I heard it, I thought I had to get out of there now. Without hesitation, I started running towards the campsite, and as I did, I could hear heavy thumping running towards the creek and the sound of bushes crunching. When everyone else got back to the campsite, I asked if they had seen or heard it, which no one had, 
and I was told that it must have been a bear. But I said that it didn't look or act like any bear I had ever seen. My friend said I must have seen a Sasquatch, and everyone laughed. I asked what a Sasquatch was. I had never seen nor heard of the Patterson-Gimlin film, and when they told me what it was, I thought that must have been what I had seen. I then started reading as much as I could about the creatures that I could find. My name is Bud, and me and my brother Charlie had something really strange happen to us a few years back. I still, to this day, have no idea why it happened. At the time, we both worked for a big oil company that has a gazillion pump jacks, and our job was to maintain them. We were based out of Carlsbad, New Mexico, and if you've ever flown over that country, you'll see that we had a big job, as there are literally thousands of pump jacks out there. Of course, we weren't the only guys doing this, but we did get stretched pretty thin sometimes. Charlie and me didn't work together unless it was something that required a second hand. We mostly just drove around from pump to pump, checking to make sure everything was working. We had a routine, and it was usually pretty predictable. Nothing much ever happened, which was how we liked it. We both lived in Carlsbad. We shared a little house out on the road to that little state park with all the desert displays, which I thought was a waste of space, since everything out here is desert, but that's another story. I kind of liked my job, as it put me out in the country most of the time, far away from people, which was good for me, and good for the human race. I used to tend to drink when I was unhappy, so I needed something to keep me happy, and being out away from everyone's problems did just that. It kept me happy. I loved driving all over the place and still being home at night, unlike the trucker job I had a few years before. As you can see, my life is full of stories, some good and some bad. I haven't decided yet if the story is good or bad. Maybe a bit of both. The bad is the crazy scary dreams I still have, but the good is that it woke me up a little started to make me realize that there are things out there that we don't have a clue about. Now you may laugh, but this story is about a Bigfoot. Yeah, I know. Everybody says I'm nuts. Crazy to even consider a Bigfoot living in southern New Mexico. What would they even eat? And where do they get their water? An animal that big would need plenty of both, and that part of the country didn't have much of either. Maybe they drink oil. I don't know. There's plenty of it out there in what's called the Permian Basin, that's for sure. That country was once a big swamp, and the Guadalupe Mountains, way over in Texas, which you could barely see from our house, the geologists say that was once a big coral reef. Ancient swamps and oceans and coral reefs mean one thing, gas and oil. I guess that's two things, isn't it? Anyway, on with the story. It was winter, which was the only time the country's even inhabitable. And then, the weather can be downright nice, even though the countryside's still as ugly as ever. I mean, people come from up north to winter around there, so I guess we have something going for us. Even though there isn't much for scenery, and that refinery in Artesia sure smells things up when the wind's just right. You wake up to this sickeningly sweet odor, just drifting down over the hills, and it's disgusting, but you get used to it. The local businesses say that it's the smell of money, but they don't seem to realize that the only reason the tourists go down there is for the mild weather and to see the caverns. Other than that, nobody would ever go down to that ugly town. Okay, so where was I? Oh yes, it was winter, which is probably the only time of year a Bigfoot can be in those parts with that big fur coat on. It was maybe 60 degrees outside, and I had just met Charlie for lunch. He had a route that kind of intersected mine, and we usually managed to hit each other at about lunchtime. So we typically had lunch down at pump 234, which is a bit up on higher ground, if you could call anywhere around there higher ground. It's all so flat. But this pump is on a hill, so we could see a bit out, 
so we'd just sit there and eat lunch together and talk about whatever, but not the scenery. Not until this particular day anyway, when Charlie was sitting there eating his sandwich. Mine was identical, since it had been my day to fix our lunches. I had finished my lunch and was taking a nap, dreaming about fishing in Montana. No sound, but the occasional thump of a pump jack. All of a sudden, Charlie reached over and kicked the bottom of my boot, waking me up. I could see he was kind of squinting. Having just had cataract surgery and not being used to his new eyes yet, looking way out at something. And I figured this had something to do with why he woke me up. So I asked him what he was looking at, and he said he didn't know, but there was some kind of thing coming up the road, and it looked to be on legs, not wheels, but it wasn't a cow or anything like it, yet it was too big to be human, and it was all brown, head to toe. I turned to see what he saw, but my eyes aren't as good, since I haven't had cataract surgery, as I'm waiting to see how Charlie does with it. All I could make out was a dot, but I could see that it was moving along at a good clip, coming right our way. Charlie now sat straight up and said he didn't have a good feeling about this. I asked if it could be a mad bull or something, looking for humans to destroy because of our bologna sandwiches, and Charlie just ignored me. Pretty soon, he was on his feet and telling me we should maybe get out of there because whatever it was, it was big and it was fast and it was coming straight our way. I asked him if maybe we weren't seeing what they called an apparition, and he answered that apparitions don't kick up dust. It had only been a minute, but when I looked again, I could see why he was concerned. This thing was big, and it was running really fast on two legs. It looked to be a grizzly bear or something like it. I thought maybe I was still dreaming, in Montana, because we sure as hell don't have grizzly bears in southern New Mexico. I'm getting out of here. Let's go, Charlie said, heading for his pickup. I'm with you, but it's coming up the road. We'll run right into it, which looks like a bad thing to do. He suggested we followed out the old drill road. It crosses the hill and comes down back up and meets with the main road. That way, we could avoid it. We took off, and I can assure you, we wasted no time. Charlie following me up the old washed out drill road. We were both super scared. Roswell isn't that far away. Maybe they had called down some weird experimental alien with their UFO stuff. We bounced those trucks and popped gears all the way up that hill. And when we got to the top, I turned around to see what was going on. Charlie was right behind me and not far behind him was one of the scariest sights I had ever seen. This thing was so big. Then I thought, it's also really hairy. He looked to be about seven feet tall, all hair, and with massive shoulders. The hair on its head blended with the hair on its body. I thought maybe it was some idiot in a suit, but no human could ever run that fast. So I decided it was a creature that I had never seen before. It would take a complete lack of brains to dress up in a monkey suit, as in this part of the country everyone would shoot first and ask later. Everybody has a pickup with long guns in the rear window. Looking back, I can say that its shape was basically that of an upright human, but there were definitely some gorilla-like characteristics as well. It was incredibly muscular, and I was especially struck by the sheer size of its biceps and the thickness of its body. Like a gorilla, I could see no neck. Charlie honked his horn while yelling for me to get going, and I headed down the other side as fast as I could go. The road was even worse on that side, all washed out and rutted, and I nearly got high-centered more than once, but managed to gun my way out of trouble. All of a sudden, I heard Charlie honking again madly, and I slowed down and looked back. He was stuck, rocking his truck back and forth, gunning it, but stuck like a jackrabbit in a New Mexico gumbo. He jumped out and ran up and jumped into my cab, yelling, totally panicked. 
The weird creature was now beside Charlie's stuck truck, pausing for a moment before continuing to come after us, and I gunned it as hard as I could. We bounced and careened down the hill, and when I got to the main road, the truck actually slammed down onto it a foot or two, nearly knocking all of my teeth out, but I didn't even pause. I just gunned it some more and kept going. It's a wonder I hadn't popped a tire or broken an axle. Charlie was watching behind us the whole time, and he later told me that this thing had been close enough to grab the tailgate, but I had hit a bump just then, throwing it back. I couldn't believe its speed. It was just hard to process how fast it could run. Now, on the main road, I was going about 50, and yet managed to hold it together, skidding around the corners and about scaring myself to death with my exceptional driving skills. We hadn't even reached pavement yet. When we finally got to the highway, I looked over at Charlie, and he was white as a sheet and shedding a few tears. I figured they were tears of joy, but he told me he was still scared and asking me what that thing was. He then asked what to do about his truck. As mad as that thing was, I didn't figure there would be any truck left to worry about, but I didn't tell him that. What worried me more was trying to explain to the boss what had happened to his truck. No way anyone would ever believe us. They'd just start looking for the whiskey bottle under the seat. I could sure use a stiff drink, I said. Charlie was worried that thing would follow us home. Even though, by now, we were on the pavement and doing at least 75. We headed on up to Artesia, where Charlie's wife, Luann, was happy to see us and didn't act a bit surprised. I knew you boys would come and see me for my birthday, she smiled. I knew Charlie had forgotten all about it. We took Luann out for a country fried steak. Then I left and ran into the store and got her some flowers and a nice card which I gave to Charlie to give to her. He stuck a little cash in it and pretended he'd known all along, and that was the reason for our visit. Neither of us mentioned one word about Bigfoot or whatever it was. We were both shell-shocked and barely even said a word to anyone. I went into the guest bedroom, hardly sleeping a wink, wondering about what I'd seen and why. When I saw Charlie the next morning, I knew he hadn't slept any either, and I assumed it was for the same reason, though I could have been wrong. He told me he was calling in and quitting, and his excuse was that he'd got drunk and left the pickup out there, and just didn't want to work there anymore. That was his story, and I was to stick with it if the boss asked me any questions. I drove on back to the house and managed to make it out to work only a little bit late, in spite of everything. I just went to work as usual, but with one difference. I now carried a long rifle in my window rack, and it was loaded. At lunch, I decided to go up and take a look at that truck, but it was gone. Apparently, the boss had come and got it first thing. I never did hear if it had any damage or not, and the boss never mentioned anything to me about nothing. Maybe he had seen the beast too, and just wanted to forget about it. I had my suspicions, as he started drinking on the job, and I was soon promoted to his job. That was fine by me, as it meant I wouldn't be out in the field much. I would just have to try and learn how to deal with being happy some other way, and humanity would have to get used to having me around. Of course, Charlie never came home, except to get his stuff. He got a job with Luann at the refinery, leaving me to batch all by myself. But things change, and one day, I met a cute ranger from the state desert park up the road. We're getting married in a few weeks, so I won't be living alone much longer. I went up there and visited her museum, and it's really pretty nice. It has a lot of nice desert stuff. One of those days, I'll ask her if she's ever considered adding a Bigfoot to the collection. I never did figure out what happened that day, but I finally quit trying. I think maybe that fellow was migrating through, and he just wanted some bologna sandwich for lunch. One thing I do know, he wasn't there for the scenery.